The electric revolution, led by the rise in EVs, is driving demand for nickel on a global scale, and it's only growing. But as we collectively try to achieve our net zero goals and create a clean energy future, we have to look big picture. The 360 degree footprint kind of big picture. Yes, nickel is the key to EV battery technology. But if it's sourced in ways that create negative environmental and social impacts, we're just moving problems around, not solving them. Mining has historically had a certain stigma associated with it. But as with most things, there's always a good and a not so good way to do it. In this episode, we're going to look at how nickel is mined, the pros and cons of different methods, the impacts and the opportunities. Ultimately, the world needs more nickel, a lot of it, which means we need more nickel mining. So it's time to learn how mining can be done properly. My first guest is Lyle Tritton, who has more than 25 years experience in the nickel industry, formerly serving as general manager sustainability with Shared International Corporation at their Alberta nickel refinery. Mr. Tritton, let's first address the elephant in the room. Why do people have so many questions when it comes to mining? What's the underlying problem? Well, it, it's not so much questions that people have. It's misconceptions that they have um, about the mining industry and how we do what we do and, and the necessity for it. You know, people just don't understand how dependent we are on mining and minerals. You know, like the number of elements in a smartphone is staggering, right? It's most of the periodic table. It's like you want a new phone or, or a bike or anything. If it's not cotton or wool, you know, we pretty much mined it, right? Well, how many elements are there? Just for comparison, if you say most of them, like what are we looking at? Uh, there's a hundred and change. Not all of them are naturally occurring. So there's like, you know, sort of 80 common naturally occur, relatively common naturally occurring elements. Uh, and like 60 of those would be something like that in a cell phone. That's a lot of stuff. So as we head into the EV world and stuff, it's like, sure, you know, you, you've never really thought about how your car gets made in the past. And now you're starting to think about it. Okay, that's good. You should have been thinking about it before, but you know, it's a start. Yeah, it's kind of like an awakening. Yeah, and it comes in stages, right? If you if if you're my age, then you you think back to the '90s and and the sweatshop scandal for Nike, or the blood diamonds, or you know more recently the artisanal mining issues and child labor and cobalt and like these things crop up every few years. You know, a, a new issue in the consumer goods area where we need to start thinking about the supply chain. Most of the time, we just don't want. To. It's hard. You realize like, well, we can, we can actually do this quite sustainably and do it with recycling and finding new ways to do things. Like we don't have to be afraid of this and we're not going to lose any of the, uh, the first world, you know, luxuries that we have along the journey either. None of this happens without more information. And, and a lot of times that comes from regulation. You wouldn't have nutrition facts on your food or enter guide labels on your refrigerator without government regulation saying you need to disclose this information. We don't have that now on the supply chain impacts of things, but it's coming. And, and that's the fundamental change that's going to drive a lot of practices to get better is the, the clarity where we understand now the impact of the supply chain of whatever it is that we're buying. Do we have some pretty big hurdles to cut dead across when it comes to all that supply chain and things? Yeah, well, it's hard. Europe is starting to go this route and they do things called product environmental footprints where, you know, you account for everything that goes into your product. So if you're making a piece of stainless steel, it's pretty straightforward. There's like eight ingredients in it. Fine. But if you're making a complex device and you have to account for every bit of it, let's say a computer, right? You have to account, if you had to account for all the chips and the case and the screen and like all these components and where they're all sourced from all the way back down the value chain, that's a lot of work. And, and so it doesn't happen without strong regulation requiring it, but it's, it's starting to happen in Europe. And, you know, we typically see things here in North America about five years later than, than where they go in Europe. When it comes to mining practices and regulations, things appear to be heading in the right direction, due in large part to the increased sharing and access of information. So in the spirit of sharing info, Mr. Tritton, how is nickel mined? Well, really, there are two principal ore types that are mined for nickel um, historically. We have sulfide ores and we have laterite or oxide ores. Historically, most of the sulfide ores that we've mined have been quite rich deposits. So this is places like Sudbury, 
uh, or, or up in Russia where there are rich deposits that are mined underground. Um, so it's more expensive to mine underground, but the ore is so good you can pay for that. By comparison, the laterite mines, because they're formed by this surface weathering, they're not very deep. They're quite shallow, typically you know, a few meters to perhaps 20 meters thick. So if you want to mine a, a substantial mass of ore, you don't do it by going deeper. You do it by going wider. And so this is where we move from open pit mining to what we call strip mining. So you remove the vegetation and the overburden, you dig up the ore, and then you move on horizontally instead of moving down. And so that means you get a very large surface footprint for the amount of ore that you extract as compared to an open pit or an underground mine. And, and so that large surface footprint is really the essential difference between them. Okay, so now that we know a little more about the stakes and the styles at play, let me ask this. In a sulfide versus laterite fight to save the world, who's the winner? Which mining approach has a better environmental footprint? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think we have to recognize right off the top that all mines have environmental impacts, right? This is the nature of the beast. So, the, But there's a wide range of them. So when we think about our different mine types, sulfide mines generally have a lower surface footprint they tend to be located in areas of lower biodiversity and lower biological productivity. There's, they're in the deserts, they're in the Canadian Shield, they're in the Arctic. Um, you know, these are important ecosystems, but they're a little bit different in nature than, say, tropical ecosystems. So the impact on the living world of these sulfide mines tends to be smaller than a similar sized mine that was somewhere more sensitive. Laterite mines are completely different. They have a large surface footprint because the deposits are thin, and they're in much tend to be in much more ecologically sensitive areas like the tropical rainforest. A laterite mine in Australia may be not such a big idea because it's in the middle of the outback. But in the tropical areas, the biodiversity is very, very high, and the species localization is very small. So you might have in from valley to valley, you'll have different species of plants and animals because the, it, the area is so productive, they don't have to go very far. And especially when you're on islands, every island can be unique. There's no escaping the fact that all mining creates environmental impacts. And even if sulfide mines tend to have the lower footprint, they still carry significant challenges and considerations. On the flip side, the same logic applies to laterite mining. Despite its obvious disadvantages, laterite mining can be done better. As Mr. Tritton said off the top, so much comes down to information, investment, regulation, and oversight. So let's stop circling and ask the question straight up. Can nickel be mined sustainably? Well, it can be. Um, I mean, it's partly definitional how you define sustainably. But, you know, the sulfide mines have a bit of a leg up because of the ability to concentrate the ore into a high-grade product for shipping and just by location and if they're underground and stuff. Um, and grid connect, where you can connect it to a low carbon grid, you know, and, and the Giga Metals Turnigan project in BC is one of these. There's some projects in Ontario and Quebec that, you know, that gives you a really good carbon footprint scenario. The laterite mines can be reasonably sustainable. Um, if they're done with good practices in strongly regulated jurisdictions. But in, in weaker systems, you often have a, a, an environmental system that's good on paper, but maybe not enforced as well in the field. And it becomes up to the discretion of the individual operator to do what they choose to do, whether it's what they think is right or whether it's what they think is cheap. So, you know, frankly, once the forest is cleared, it's too late to preserve biodiversity. Um, and so, you know, it can be done well. It's just not always done well. And many of the jurisdictions that have the largest nickel deposits also have very poor records on governance and corruption. So, you know, you can run a clean operation in a country like that, but it is harder. And, and we have to expect that the burden of proof is on the operator to show that they're not enriching bureaucrats and cronies and, and stuff. It, it can be hard to manage where there is an expectation of payoffs and whether they're under the table or whatever. And then, of course, there's social issues, the S in ESG. So in Canada, we've formally in implemented UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and we're working towards ensuring real, free, prior, and informed consent of impacted groups. 
So in developing countries, those practices can vary quite widely. And like environmental practices, what happens in the field may not be the same as on paper when it comes to you know, getting consent or relocating people who are in the way of, of the mining activities. You can relocate people well, or you can bring in the army to evict them, right? It still gets them out of the way. But we've seen blockades of projects. We've seen the Catholic Church come out and take a stand on behalf of people in some countries, like in the Philippines. Really? Oh, absolutely. The The Catholic Church at one time was completely anti-mining in the Philippines. I think they've reversed that a little bit now, but they've seen a lot of negative impacts to Indigenous peoples and, and local villages from you know, fairly aggressive tactics by mining companies. And, and you know, regardless of economic spin-offs that are, that are theorized, it was very negative for the communities. There is clearly a lot of potential and money in nickel, which can be both a good and bad thing. In some cases, we see people, businesses, and governments chasing dollars without proper regulation or oversight. But in other cases, we're seeing increased demand drive investment in innovation that sparks real change and opportunity. Solving environmental challenges isn't just about minimizing the negatives. It's about finding the positives, too. This is where my next guest comes in. Meet Dr. Greg Dibble, professor of geological sciences at the University of British Columbia, who works with industry on trying to incorporate carbon capture and storage into mine development. Dr. Dipple, can you explain to us how the nickel mining process works in terms of carbon capture potential? For the rocks that host the, the nickel, the, you know, most of what you mine ends up being waste. So, you know, often 90 plus percent of what you mine is waste because you're pulling out a small amount of concentrated metal. And so, um, you know, there's almost a one to one relationship between the, the amount of material that you're mining and the amount of waste that you're producing. And sometimes that waste material is inherently reactive to carbon dioxide like we have in the atmosphere from fossil fuel combustion. So if you're generating a waste that can be reactive to carbon dioxide that generates the potential to use that waste as a, as a means to both capture uh, carbon dioxide as well as to put it into a mineral form where it is uh, very dense, it's solid, and it has a storage safety that is um, very high duration, so hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So it can be a very safe place to put carbon dioxide. Is this uh, what's referred to as carbon sequestration? Yeah. Okay, and... Is nickel mining likely suited for this process more than others when it comes to mineral? Yeah, it's one of the, there's a few commodities where this where this has a lot of potential and and nickel is one of the primary ones. Diamond mines, diamonds, uh, a lot of diamond deposits are are uh, in similar material which also has reactivity to CO2. Um, and then, you know, the associated metals like platinum group elements and palladium and and potential for nickel and or for copper and those things which also have potentially have value in um in the long you know the, in the um generation of renewable energy and so forth there's there's a really good alignment yeah on the tech side too uh, like there's there's tons of benefits with this i feel yeah and you know the forecast for what is thought to going to be needed if, if we're going to you know electrify our transportation sector for example at least the personal transportation sector then um, based on you know current and 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 near term battery technologies, we're going to, going to need supplies of some of these metals like nickel at a scale that has never been accessed in human history. So we're gonna you know you can't recycle your way out of this because we've never mined that much nickel before in human history. So there is if we're going to go in those directions, we need certain types of metals in a, in quantities that we have not produced them before. So that has implications for how we source those metals. Right. And, and I wonder how much has changed in nickel mining. Like, are, are we able to find a balance in a, in, a, in a way to do this with the current mining processes we have? Uh, I, I would say that's a work in progress. So, yeah. So, you know, we've worked, been working on this for, for 20 years, actually, um, in various types of, of, of mines and starting with including nickel mines from the very beginning. And we've found some places where there's actually quite a bit of carbon capture happening uh, as part of basic operations. So the one of the more dramatic examples that we documented um, was the Mount Keith nickel mine in uh, Western Australia, which is a major producer of nickel. Uh, it's run by BHP. Um, had um, Sasha Wilson in her PhD thesis here at UBC uh, documented that uh, they were accidentally and unknowingly 
capturing um, about 40,000 tons a year of CO2 in their tailings and mineralizing it, and then uh, burying it within the, the storage facility. So that was that represents about 11% of their total mine emissions that was being offset by by things going on in their tailing storage facility that was unintentional. And initially, uh, they were unaware of it. And so and we know that we can develop technologies to, to increase those rates. So that opens up the option that some mines should be able to operate with substantial greenhouse gas reductions and even operate um, so, you know, something approaching carbon neutral. And if you start to look at how mines are being planned for the future, where they're using renewable energy for their electricity production, and within, you know, they're already, there's already work underway in, in transforming hull fleets so that they don't run off fossil fuels. If you start to make those kinds of changes, then the carbon footprint of mining is dramatically reduced. And you suddenly can envisage that, you know, the mines that are in, in the planning stage today could actually be built in such a way that they would be carbon negative. So they would not only decarbonize the supply chain for electric vehicle batteries, but they would also provide a carbon removal benefit for um, for the rest of the society. Dang. That, <laughs> I didn't realize this is a pretty big deal Once if we can get this stuff moving and things like that for the future. Like you said, with this electric vehicle revolution and the, uh, the electrification of everything, this is a must have. And it sounds like we're well on the way. It's definitely achievable with the existing technology. We just have to find the right places to do it and build and design the mines to, to maximize the process. Absolutely. Okay, now this is the kind of information that gives me some serious hope and excitement for the future of clean energy. Clearly, we all need some more Dr. Dipple in our lives. The idea that nickel mines could actually provide a carbon removal benefit to the world is the definition of flipping the script. But when you hear the science behind it from smart people like Mr. Tritton and Dr. Dipple, it's not wishful thinking, it's very real and attainable, with the right support, of course. So, what does that support look like? Are investors able to get over the historic stigmas with mining and see the potential? Let's go back to Mr. Tritton, because according to him, it just might be happening, or at least starting to. A year and a half ago, I was at a conference in Toronto, and I talked to some representatives of large European pension funds who were very keen on investing in renewable energy, energy grid, transmission projects, those kinds of things. And, and you know, it, it was all a green thesis. And I said, what about mining? You know, I have a mine, I'm working on a mining project. We're going to need a, a big hydroelectric transmission grid to power the mine. The mine's going to be sustainable, this, that, the next thing. And, and the answer was simply, we're not interested in mining. We might help fund the hydroelectric transmission line, mm-hmm. but we won't touch a mining project. And you're starting to see that change now, that those attitudes are evolving as people realize somebody's got to fund these things. If right. we're going to build yeah. millions, hundreds of millions of EVs, somebody's got to fund the mines. And so the, we're now seeing both the car companies, the battery companies, the investment companies starting to look around at each other and go, well, who's going to support this? Nickel is key to our clean energy future. Yes, this is a true statement, but it can also be somewhat misleading, or at the very least limiting. When we talk about our clean energy future, we must do so within a 360-degree cradle-to-grave perspective, otherwise known as the entire footprint. This is why it's not just nickel, but nickel mining that is the real key to net zero. The world appears to be waking up to this reality, albeit slowly. Stigmas are being challenged, and in some cases, we're actually flipping the narrative, turning problems into opportunities. Mining doesn't have to be an obstacle to overcome in our pursuit of electrification and net zero. With the right support, it can be part of the solution. Within the world of nickel mining, investment is a key driver in creating much-needed innovation and governance. And while the dollars have historically gone to the shinier, more exciting parts of the electrification story, like battery tech and EVs, key stakeholders and investors are starting to realize that nothing EV is possible without mining. Makes sense. This is why our next episode does a deep dive into the nickel mining investment story. Thanks for listening to the Charge Podcast. Make sure you catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more info, visit thechargepodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn and at the underscore charge underscore pod on Twitter. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We'd love to hear from our listeners. The Charge is a Giga Metals podcast produced by Podium Podcast Company.